Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Kidney Coach YouTube channel. I am naturopathic Dr. Fiona Chin, co-author of the Kidney Disease Solution and co-formulator at Kai Genesis. And I'm joined again by the lovely Jessie Anna Seville from the Kidney Nutritional Institute. Jessie Anna is a renal dietitian and heads up the team at KNI with an amazing bunch of practitioners that if you haven't seen before, have been on our YouTube channel and podcast several times. Jessie Anna, thank you so much for joining me again today and sharing your precious wisdom and time with us. We always appreciate you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's great. I always like coming here and I always like talking kidneys because I yeah. think it's fun. So nobody better than talking about it than with you. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. <laughs> So today we wanted to cover a topic that is a simple topic, but probably some uh, a topic that a lot of people with kidney disease may not know, and that is just what foods you should avoid if you've got kidney disease or a family history of kidney disease and what foods should be cut out and why. So I'm going to hand the floor across to you, Jessiana, and I'm going to let you take away, and I know you've got lots of research and understand the chemical processes behind all of this. So if I'm diagnosed with kidney disease or there's a family history, what food should I definitely be taking off the menu? Okay, so we're going to talk about six foods tonight, and they're not going to be what you suspect. So just for fun, right before we got on, Fiona and I, we did a quick Google, like top 10 foods you should eliminate if you have kidney disease. And I thought Fiona's eyes were going to fall out of her sockets because she's like, avocados, <laughs> tomatoes, <laughs> like all these good oh, things. I oh, right? <laughs> but I'm, you know, like I, I will do those searches sometimes because I'm curious what's showing up in the top 10 in Google. But here's the thing. What we're going to talk about tonight is there is zero produce in what we're going to talk about. I personally believe that almost every like good whole food fruit vegetable can fit in the diet for people with kidney disease. There's just a place for all of those. And there's so much uh, scare blogs, so many scare articles on the internet that really don't give credit to the foods that people should really, really be mindful of. And the six we're going to talk about today, I think are game changers where we have, I have seen people just work through eliminating or being cautious about these foods and it making a huge difference. So no matter where you're at in your journey, this is a good, simple place to start when just talking about these six foods that can really change the direction of, you know, where things are going for you. Yeah, I totally agree with that. All right. What is number one on your list, Jesse Anna? Number one. Okay, number one. And I know everyone's waiting. I'm just tell one more quick thing here because it <laughs> ties into the conversation of all of these. So I had a patient and I remember he used to always tell me things go with things, right? Like cheese goes with crackers, meat goes with potatoes, French fries go with hamburger. He'd always tell me that. He's like, things just go with things. So like, <laughs> if I want to eat something. I got to have the thing that goes with the thing. <laughs> I was thinking about that. So when we go through these, uh, some of the importance of them is what they're tied to. It's like not the food expressly. And I'm going to talk about that, especially with number one. But a lot of times it's really hard for us to separate out where the the problem, problem, problem is. And sometimes it's not even one thing anyways. All of us want like the magic thing that if we just take it out, the problem solved. And when it comes to nutrition, that's not the case because things go with things. And a lot of things that we eat and the ways that we eat are tied together and you can have multiple driving factors of decline or health within one you know, dietary practice. So mm -hmm. preface, before we get to number one, drum roll. So the first one that we wanted to talk about is fast food. Uh, especially, you now can fast food fit for some people? Absolutely. But uh, fast food as far as like hamburger and French fries every day, fried chicken, mashed potatoes every day or on a regular basis, always getting a Starbucks, always getting, you know, like always interfacing with these places where food is meant to be fast. Mm. There can be a lot of harm in that. Now, there's been a lot of experiments <laughs> done just by lay people. Like, if I put this French fry in a jar, how long before it actually deteriorates, right? Like, how many preservatives or salt is in this food that it won't even deteriorate? And I always think those are interesting and kind of funny because they really show that these foods that are processed upstream and then frozen, then brought to the fast food places, 
they are they are meant to fulfill a need not necessarily of health certainly they will fill your stomach they're not meant to fulfill a health need they're really meant to be fast and get food to people fast so people can leave and go on their way there are some healthy fast foods but as a majority they're quite processed they have a lot of preservatives they're salt salt laden and so really decreasing the amount of fast food i think is probably one of the number one things in a busy westernized lifestyle that people can do to really help their kidney health. I cannot like overstate this. It really is huge to just bring the food back home in a more wholesome manner, or even just like what choices you make at a fast food place makes a huge difference. Yeah, I totally agree with that one. I mean, that was that that, um, documentary supersized me. I mean, if you haven't seen that, that pretty much sums it up of what happens to his cholesterol and diabetes he becomes a you know he gets cardiovascular disease and he becomes pre-diabetic and of course they're the two major drivers of kidney disease so that was a great um experiment yeah it came out when i was in school to be a dietitian that that documentary and i remember there being a lot of conversation like yeah but we need to moderate and you know every once in a while it's okay but every once in a while sometimes with fast food ends up being oh I'm in a hurry so now it's today again and again and again it can be hard to change those habits when you always have that crutch so I think when you're trying to break out of the I'm in a hurry and so I just grab something real quick type of pattern it's nice to just say hey like what happens if for 30 days I don't eat fast food yeah let me try let me see what happens with my labs and like prove it to yourself it makes a huge difference yeah totally agree all right Fast food, number one. What is number two? Okay, so number two, kind of along the same line of things go things, (laughs) soft drinks. Um, Coke and Pepsi get a fair amount of spotlight. Sorry, Coca-Cola and Pepsi. (laughs) They get a fair amount of spotlight in the kidney world because they're very heavy laden with phosphate additives. So they they get a lot of attention. People are often told by the doctors, don't drink dark sodas is what they'll Mm -hmm. be told. But I think there's something to be said for being cautious of all sodas, especially, and I don't even think there's an especially, I'm not sure you can really win on soda Mm. because you either have high fructose corn syrup or you have artificial sweeteners in there. And both of them, we're going to talk about both of them. (laughs) That's number (laughs) uh, three and five here, maybe three. But both of those things have some pretty strong ties to disease processes, Mm. like fructose corn syrup and artificial sweeteners. So soft drinks to me are kind of one that if you can phase them out, makes a huge difference. If you like, like the fizzy taste, I, I really like fizzy. Then start with just doing like what do I have on my desk? I have like a sparkly mineral water. <laughs> yeah, let's put some lemon in it to get a taste into yeah, it. Put some lemon in it so that it, you know, that it tastes good. Uh, but like make that your treat and start phasing it out. Uh, that would be one that I think can make a, a really huge impact. Plus people consume tons of just, let's call them sugar calories. Mm. So you're, trying to lose weight. you're just consuming sugar calories from soda because it seems cheap and easy. It tastes good. You're hydrated. It's not, it was doing you zero favors. Yeah. Zero, zero favors. I feel like this is a, a no help. Like it's not even neutral. It's just, it's, it's really hurting people. Yeah. So I think soft drinks are things to get phased out as much as possible. Totally agree. All right. What's number two on your hot list there? Uh, Number three, three. fast food, soft drinks. That's okay. We had, we had one one that we were going to go over and then we're like ah there's a lot more on this we we saved it for later we'll talk about ultra charged food later but not tonight (laughs) uh so number three along the same line are artificial sweeteners Mm. especially and this is a hot hot topic this week there was a big study that came out erythritol tied with heart disease so all this explanation has gone through all the keto groups that we're involved with all the dietitian groups like what do people think of this but just artificial sweeteners as a whole. If you think about things like sucralose, aspartame, Splenda, Equal, you know, the pink, blue, yellow packets, those sweeteners, every single one of them now has evidence behind it that it it can cause health issues. Mm-hmm. Sucralose or Splenda has problems with the gut microbiome. It 
hundred percent changes the gut microbiome. Um, the, the aspartame has some direct ties with kidney disease. Mm-hmm. They're, uh, like every single one of them has something. And so I feel like these artificial sweeteners, those three, like, I feel like the evidence is strong enough that I can be very confident as a dietitian saying, can we find another option for you? The other ones that are emerging, they're kind of newer. And I think the evidence is emerging is overly processed stevia. And stevia is my preferred one. So I'll just put that out as a disclaimer, but overly processed stevia, mm-hmm. any of these things processed, right? Uh, erythritol, all of the alls, mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. sugar, alcohols, yeah. they all impact our health. So while I think a sweetener, maybe like stevia, erythritol, people are can use it to bridge a gap in maybe changing their taste buds. I know that's how I've used it because I like sweet, like I grew up liking sweet. Mm-hmm. And that's one habit that I slowly have been trying to like get away from. But you're getting away from sweet and being able to find like sweetness in real food, right? Whatever the real food is you want to find it in, mango, dates, there's so many yeah, yeah. Natural, so good food. Yeah. You're just naturally sweet. I mean, we had uh, yams tonight with our dinner and they were actually kind of sweet. Like I was eating them. I was like, these are really good, but they're kind of sweet. So sweetness naturally occurring in food. I think that's a, you know, where I would focus more my sweet effort. <laughs> and uh, if you need to use some, like a little bit of stevia, a little bit of erythritol as a bridge, great. But the aspartame, uh, Splenda, Equal, I'm uh, uh, forgetting all the names. Those ones I'd say out, yeah. like eliminate them, throw them out. Don't even donate them to anyone because they do <laughs> nobody any favors. Yeah, no, totally agree. All right. No, I'm on the same page with you that one. So number four on our list, what do we got next? Okay, so I'm going to, since we're on sweet, I'm talking about high fructose corn syrup. Yeah. <laughs> so high fructose corn syrup is another one that I think is to be very wise and cautious with. Now, food manufacturers have started shifting. I've noticed in a lot of our products are starting to use cane sugar now mm-hmm. instead of high fructose corn syrup. But high fructose corn syrup has compounding, compounding, compounding evidence on the health risks that come with it. I, mm-hmm. I know you had a, a really good story that you were telling me just before we got on on just like how it can change people's just. Yeah, health. it's crazy. When I lived in Canada for two years in 2006 and in Australia, high fructose corn syrup wasn't really been added to much locally, but of course, in the states and Canada, it was in yo- it was in yogurts, it was in everything. You know, I'd look at the back and I'd be like, "Why in my natural yogurt is there high modified corn syrup in here? Like, there is just no need." And it'd be interesting. You'd go into restaurants or wherever you were, and someone would look normal from the waist up, and they would move out from behind the counter, and they would be morbidly obese waist down which is what high modified corn syrup does it it's really a driver of diabetes and that central insulin resistance and yeah it's crazy it was crazy for me to see because we just australia's caught up now this was this was back in 2004 but you know we i just never seen anything like that before and it was of course in the states and canada i saw that and I remember looking into it and they were saying it was the uh, the really modified high corn syrup that was driving that. So yeah, crazy. Yeah. I I think it's, to me, it's kind of, a, it's a super easy swap because there are lots, I mean, if you're like, I love sweet, right? Sweet is your thing and you're on that journey of, you know, modifying your health. Maybe you're not starting with sweet or I'm starting by adding more vegetable, whatever. So sweet in your diet. The, um, you can find a lot of products now that don't have high fructose corn syrup. And I think it's really prudent to be wise and look for where it's added at and see if you can find a substitute or eliminate it completely. Because that insulin resistance, while it's really important for diabetes, diabetes drives kidney disease for sure. Insulin resistance itself, even that mild insulin resistance, if you don't have diabetes, can still be a huge part of kidney health in the end Mm -hmm. that insulin resistance and how our body uses insulin is tied to our kidney health so that is another one that i think being conscientious of it it's not actually so hard to eliminate you know like where is it oh (laughs) the 
the uh, fruit snacks that I thought were super awesome. And I like always throw them in my purse or whatever. And then you're like, oh, I, but yeah, they're made with high fructose corn syrup. And this mm-hmm. is what I eat every day. <laughs> you know, like fruit snacks, worst, worst slash best bar can eat ever towards kids. But, you know, like fruit snacks or candy or the sodas, right? Things go with things, high fructose corn syrup and then soda, sodas or you know, if you're getting snack pack puddings or just, yeah. it's really a lot of processed foods, it's cheap, it's easy to add, kind of, it's just very neutral flavor, but it is one that hundred percent I think is really important to eliminate. Yeah. And that one's got some really good research articles behind it about it increasing the resistance in the vascular tissue inside the kidneys. So, which we obviously want to avoid when it comes to fibrosis. And there's, if you look at that, there's plenty of studies with that direct link to kidney disease. So that's a big yeah. one to avoid. Yeah. And then I know you've talked and talked with me about many times like that vascularization, meaning the blood that can get into the kidneys and bring it nutrients, take away waves, whatever. I mean, our blood flow, our vascularization system is so important. That is really important to preserve and enhance as much as possible, mm. especially in the presence of kidney disease. So yeah, high fructose corn syrup hitting on that vascular system is one that I think is really critical to eliminate. Yeah, I totally agree. Okay, we're on to number five now, if I'm counting. Yeah, okay, so number five would be really, really heavy portions of meat. Mm. Okay, now I know carnivore crowd, they're going to disagree with me. (laughs) I'm sure there have been situations of kidney success in carnivorism. But as a general insight, what I have seen from working with hundreds of patients over the years is that patients that are on these very heavy protein diets, and this is another one, it's hard to piece out, right? Because things go with things, high protein, high carb together, they are just on this downward march with their kidney disease. When we start switching that around and we're like, okay, let's just get protein to a normal amount, a, a, a normal amount. I mean, in America, the average amount of protein is like 1.2 to 1.5 grams per kilogram and a normal amount is 0.8 to 1 gram per kilogram. Wow, oh, that's so, really high. Yeah, so Americans just in general tend to eat a lot of protein. And uh, when you just normalize it, like, hey, let, let's just bring it down to kind of a normal amount of protein let's flesh out all those good alkaline veggies because that's going to balance out where you feel like they got a hole on your plate right fill it up with vegetables when you do that i really think that you're able to stabilize a lot of kidney function for for many people just getting that meat portion normal if people choose to continue to eat meat which it can fit great in a kidney diet um but you must have a normalized portion for sure yeah 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 no I was just going to say you know like you know people with the carnivore diet and obviously our ancient paleolithic diets but you got to remember hunter and gatherers to get and kill a buffalo say they would have to feed a whole tribe of people they weren't eating a lot of it they were eating then a lot of organ meat which is not so high in protein more nutrient rich and so they wouldn't be eating a whole pile of meat every day. They'd be eating then the gathering of like fruits and vegetables and all those sort of things. So I think also, you know, it doesn't totally relate to our ancestor crowd anyway, just a whole lot of meat, unless you're really allergic yeah. to bland phytochemicals in autoimmune diseases and maybe um, useful. I, I totally agree. I, I don't think you can translate paleolithic to modern day because also if you're going to hunt and kill a buffalo, <laughs> it's a whole lot of physical activity. Yes make that happen plus like i mean just like a hunter gathered nature our ancestral people their lifestyle was very very different very different on activity level so it's i I don't i think it's kind of comparing apples and oranges saying that diet worked in the past it should work now but the principle that is true no matter what is that the more you move towards whole foods and definitely including fibrous foods because it helps nurture our gut Mm -hmm. Those things are strong, powerful principles that have been, that have stood the test of time. They they show up in all different types of dietary research, Mediterranean diet, all all sorts of things. And those, those are good, powerful principles to lean into that I feel like make a big impact. Yeah, I agree. Okay. 
What is the last on our list for okay. today, Jessiana? Um, the last one, yeah, so last one, number six, would be MSG and sodium intake. So we kind of clumped these together because MSG is often used as a salty, a salting agent, a preservative agent. Um, but there is research on MSG, again, kind of impacting that vascular system. Uh, sodium intake, we already know that there's plenty of pathways that sodium plays into for kidney disease, whether it is on how it pushes blood pressure or, um, there, I mean, there's, there's a lot of different pathways, not just blood pressure. And I'm just like, it's one of the ones with the sodium phosphorus balance, right? You are sure you're talking about that, but often people with high potassium, it's actually a, a, in, an excessive intake of sodium is pushing up that. Balance, yeah. Right? So you can, yeah. So there's that one. There's also, it can impact your gut even. So there's a lot of different places where heavy sodium intake plays into the diet. And again, this is another one that's like things go with things because mm -hmm. a lot of times when people have a heavy sodium diet, it's because going back to number one, <laughs> they're eating out all the time. Yeah. And so when you can, as, as you shift, right, as you shift to like, I'm going to eat at home, I'm going to try preparing some of my meals at home. I'm going to bring the sodium down. I have more control in my house with that. Then you also start eating more simple foods, less preservatives. <laughs> and so you know, as people strive to like, I'm going to reduce sodium in my diet. No is not better than low. That's our always our catchphrase. No is not better than low. But as you reduce sodium in your diet, especially from eating out outside foods, you'll see that because you're doing that, you're starting to do a lot of other things that are really good for your kidneys. Yeah, I totally agree. Perfect. Is there anything else you want to say about foods and avoiding and kidney disease we are charred meat was on our list but we decided we wanted to actually pull up the exact research so we could because we think there's a marker in there but we neither of us could remember off the top of our head what it was so we'll come I, back gotta, I gotta pull it up yeah charred meat is one that i like old like very very charred meat i know it tastes yeah. good at the barbecue fourth of july <laughs> but like <laughs> it's one that in in the states fourth of july is our big barbecue holiday at yeah. the game, whatever. but it is one to avoid We'll talk about that more in depth because I wanted to actually pull up some of the studies and and yeah. talk through the pathway on it. Um, but uh, but yeah, I I just I really like this list because I do feel like all of these things are things that are honestly fairly easy to shift because there's so many good substitutes for them that are readily available. Yeah, you know, it's it's easy to switch fast food to something that's a little bit more high quality, even if it's a frozen meal mm. that doesn't have preservatives in it. Right. Yeah. Uh, you know, moving away from soft drinks, doing like sparkling water or just real water, <laughs> um, like artificial sweeteners, you know, like maybe you just use a little bit of honey or a little bit of maple syrup instead uh, you know, normalizing your portions of meat and then tackling MSG and sodium, really, really easy. And it makes way more sense. It makes so much more sense to me than if you look up lists that are like, hey, if you have kidney disease, cut out all the healthy food that you thought was good for you. Yeah. Because yeah. they don't, there's not a good explanation behind most of those that is up to date. And so yes. if you've been following those lists, like, throw them out. I'm sorry, like Healthline, Mayo Health, and Avita, like all the top 10, their lists are incorrect. Yeah. And we did a couple episodes on potassium and such to kind of clarify those myths. Yeah. No, perfect. All right. Well, thank you. I think that's a nice, good, useful information for people. And like you say, really easy to implement and put into your life, but not too scary. So if you want to know more about Jessiana and her team, she works with a whole team of renal dietitians that are dedicated to just working with kidney disease and are, as we just said, up to date with the latest research coming out with kidney disease, because there is a lot of misnomers out there about what is right and what isn't um, to do in kidney disease. Head over to kidneynutritionalinstitute.org. K and I, and you can go and they've got some free programs you can sign up for. And the best part is no matter where in the world you are, Jessiana and her team can work with you because they also work remotely, which is always great. 
Make sure you hit subscribe. That way you'll get notified anytime we put up new videos and hit like. That always helps our YouTube algorithms. If you want to know more about what we do, head to www.kidneycoach.com. You can also find us on Facebook, on Facebook forward slash Kidney Coach. Jessie Anna, thanks again for your time. I always appreciate you and I'll see you all next time. Bye. Thank you.